Shalom, shalom, and Boker Tov to everyone. This is Rabbi Moshe Otero, Ways of Israel. And we had a wonderful weekend, Memorial Weekend, enjoying and recognizing those fallen heroes which uh, died for this country. And the, the very struggle that we're having now really is of great importance to many of us um, Americans, the patriots, who feel that we're uh, in this struggle of keeping this republic. Uh, in, in shape and in, in in state because we're about to lose it if we don't take care of our freedoms. Same thing that happened in Israel thousands of years ago when they opened up, uh, you might say, the same similar things uh, that we're seeing here in this country, including um, the, the amount of immigrants coming into this co country and there is no checks and balances. As a matter of fact, the prophets speak about that very profusely regarding what was allowed to take place where those coming in basically began to take over uh, the country and the government and a whole bunch of other things. I won't get into all that because that's not what is the topic of today. Uh, rather, we're going to continue this line of thinking uh, with Rabbi Joseph Albo, who happens to be a middle, middle, middle evil or middle age uh, Rabbi who, who was speaking in reference to the struggles that he was seeing uh, with the Jewish community and his current uh, situation among the uh, Christendom of his time. <clears throat> and so he begins to define the workings of the prophet and um, what the prophets would learn from God and what they would learn from other prophets that made them who they are. And this is very important to understand this concept that Rabbi Albo brings about in this notion of Navua or prophecy, which is part of the revelation of God's uh, word, God's knowledge, God's understanding from a divine perspective and also a human perspective, understanding that, uh, which is what we're looking to, to comprehend. So with no further delay, I... Um, I want to go right into the study of uh, Sefer Haikarim, but uh, many of you have, have asked, Rabbi, how can we help you? And I want to respond to that question, how can we help you? Very easily, uh, I've always put here via this site the way you can be of a great blessing to the ways of Israel or Los Caminos Israel. And obviously, you can support, you can share, you can volunteer, you can also uh, donate um, the gift of tzedakah or of maaser, of tithing to our institution. It is a Torah institution and we've done incredible things and we still are doing things throughout the world including our new, you might say, Pet P, which is in Houston, Texas with Rabbi Michael Perry who's out there working on developing a community and of course we want to give him all of our support be part of the What's Up channel that's out there in Houston, Texas. If you need me to uh, send you a connection, please feel free to reach out to me and I will connect you there with them. Now, also, very fascinating, I got a call this week or this weekend uh, from another rabbi, uh, Rabbi Kempi, regarding a group of people in El Paso, Texas, El Paso, Texas. And of course, we are very interested in helping. Uh, establish new Jewish communities uh, throughout the world, including this one that is developing in El Paso, Texas. I'm going to reach out to the gentleman again in El Paso to work out the details that's needed to make sure that we can be able to help them and be of a blessing <clears throat> and see Judaism grow throughout. Judaism is growing. <clears throat> that is a fact. And as a result, the world is shaking as a as a word because we're seeing many people wanting to become Jewish. Uh, it's not enough just to follow the seven laws for them, and they want more. They just are not satisfied just to be taught from far away and to learn. There's a whole difference between attending a a, a congregation in person and being part of a community, physical community, than just virtual. Virtual has its good pluses, especially as we saw during the pandemic. And all of a sudden, a whole bunch of rabbis uh, jumped on the bandwagon to push the the, uh, <clears throat> the 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 virtual teachings and the virtual minions and the virtual this and that. 
but there's nothing like having someone that you can go to see face to face and really enjoy their, their presence but this has been a very explosive dynamic doing it by by virtual uh, means and I mean by virtual I mean we see live face-to-face -face interaction uh, zoom has boomed be because of this and other um, mediums that allow live action to take place a lot of things have been able to be done as a result and I think there's more rabbis today that realize the importance of the the virtual which is not really virtual it's live it's the same time it's like having glasses on and, and, and expanding it and being able to see what perhaps you didn't see before so in some sense you know uh, you're able to see things in areas what's going on and it really brings a, a lot of, of joy at least to me to see how Judaism is growing leaps and bounds communities are being blessed um, and they're being strengthened by their connection to Judaism. The only thing that we can hope and pray that hopefully those that are uh, trying to direct everything from out of Israel would understand that they're dealing with something much greater than they themselves and open up the door further and, and, and don't close the doors as they have been doing for the past uh, 10 years and plus closing the doors in the face of those who wish to become part of the children of Israel and Kalal Israel. Don't be like those that basically put a letter in front of the entry to Israel and if you're a convert you will be rejected, will not be called up to the Torah, which is a big hill of Hashem. Let me say that again. It's a big hill of Hashem. And they, sh they should be reprimanded by every single Jew or anyone who has a consciousness of what Torah teaches regarding um, the converts and the proselytes and that's why I've always been very sensitive to that, to that issue uh, not only here in the local community but worldwide because it's a big Chilok Hashem and I, I'm convinced, I have no doubt I have no doubt that as a result of the mistreatment of many converts uh, God is mistreating our people and I say mistreating not in the in a bad sense, but in the sense of corrective measures are being taking place, are taking place as a result of what's happening, because they cry unto God, the proselyte cries unto God, and God responds in kind. And this is why God commands the Jews to love the proselyte in your midst, to love them, to take care of them, to to bring them in, not to push them out. Big difference. You know, you can be discouraged two, three times, but to be hit in the head, as it were, uh, with a full, complete rejection, there's no basis for that. Absolutely no basis in halacha to make a person feel less human than, than what they are. And God has created all human beings in His image, with no exception. And there's no difference between a person who basically wants to join the, the, the Jewish people and a person who's beginning to understand, comprehend the Jewish message and is asking questions. Many of these people, they're coming from within the Abrahamic covenant. They're not coming from a Noahide covenant, although many of those who were involved in the Christian world, the Abrahamic Covenant, according to the Christian concept, are leaving it to go into the Noahide movement, which is a brand new movement, as we know. Now, the laws are not brand new. The seven universal laws are not brand new. But the idea of trying to formulate <clears throat> a whole movement uh, called the Noahide movement is very new, and this is the reason why even though in the, in the past I used to teach and organize communities of Noahides, I realized as Rabbi Michael Katz, who is one of the pioneers in this area, said to me, he goes, most of these people, they don't want to be Noahide. They don't want to follow just the seven. They want to be Jews. So why should we continue to be able to push on them the seven Noahide laws when in fact, when in fact, they're rejecting it. They don't want it. Another thing that always piqued my interest was the fact that in order to be an observant Noahide or 
followers or children of Noah, they have to come before Ibed Din to accept upon themselves the laws according to what was given by the rabbis and by Moses, by the law of Moses. And this becomes problematic because there's no Bad Din, except I remember <clears throat> some time back the, in the Noahide movement, um, the Sanhedrin, the reformulated Sanhedrin, which I don't know where that stands today, um, it doesn't have the strength that initially it had, um, but it was working with creating uh, the rules and regulations in order for a Bad Din in uh, Tiberius to be able to recognize these individuals on that level before a court, um, a rabbinical court, to do so. We do have a rabbinical court that we can process these recognitions and make it a valid and recognizable uh, decision. But I discourage, personally I discourage um, the idea of embracing uh, the Noahide, but rather push forward the conversion because you're going to be part of a family, you're going to be part of a people, and you're not going to be stuck in the the state of of um, of in between state because a lot of these people are coming out of Christianity and they're used to congregating and being part of a congregation, and in that situation, like I, I shared with a various one of you, you're in that process, stop. It's okay if you don't accept everything of Christendom, of the Christian theology, but it's better, and as you know it's true, to be part of a, a congregation, a community, than to be completely isolated and singled out, completely set apart, separated from everything and everyone that is dear to you. So in that, in that situation, I follow what Rabbi Jacob Emden said in that um, Christianity brought upon the world a double blessing. We may not like what Rabbi Jacob Emden said, we may disagree with what Rabbi Jacob Emden says, but there is some major truth in what he stated when he said that. Notice he never said this regarding the seven universal laws. Rather, he said this only specifically regarding the founder and what he brought upon the world. And thus, and thus, his words ring true even to the day. And this is the reason why I'm thinking seriously to do a study with Jacob Emden's material as to why he said these things. Obviously, it's preferable, as the Rambam indicates, to convert to Judaism, to be part of the children of Israel, to take hold of the Torah, in all of its meanings and not just water it down to just seven or 33 basic laws. There's much more involved in following God's Word and God's Torah. Well, enough of that. Let's get into the Sefer HaIkarim in this morning's learning, which I find to be very, very important because he brings out, Rabbi Alba brings about, there's a great difference between the thing which a prophet learns from God and a thing which is told to him by another prophet. A thing which a prophet hears from God cannot be abolished unless he subsequently hears from God a statement opposed to the first. Th th thus Abraham was told, Take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou loveth, even Isaac, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering. And later he was told, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. Now Edo the prophet was devoured by a lion as a punishment because he listened to the old prophet in Bethel. In Bethel and went back to Bethel and ate bread there and contrary to the order he had received directly from God but any command that comes to one through a prophet may be opposed by a contrary command from another prophet. For this reason God desired that all of Israel should hear from him directly the Ten Commandments and that no prophet may have the power to abolish them in whole or in part. This is a very important statement of which Rabbi Alba makes, brings to the equivalence of all of Israel being like a prophet, a nation of prophets, of priests. This is stated explicitly in the scripture. These words of the Lord spoke unto all your assembly in the mount. 
And he wrote them upon the two tables of stone and gave them unto me. But there is some difficulty in connection with the statement of the rabbis at the end of the treaties of Makot and that of the first two commandments which were heard directly from the mouth of the all-powerful, all the omnipotent, and that strength. This is strange, for the Bible says, And the Lord delivered unto me the two tables of stone written with the finger of God, and then... And on them was written according to all of the words which the Lord spoke with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And again he wrote on the tables according to the first writing the ten words, the ten sayings which the Lord spoke unto you in the mount of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them unto me. And from all of this it appears clearly that all ten commandments which were written on the tables were spoken to all of Israel. How then can, he, can the rabbis say that, the, that they heard from God the first two commandments only and not the rest? Well, Maimonides in his, his guide of the perplexed says, and this Rabbi Abel is quoting, says that the expression of the rabbis they heard from the very mouth of strength means that they heard them from the very force of rational demonstration. For his idea is that first the commandment teaches the existence of God and then the second the unity of God, both being principles which can be proved by reason and it is also the opinion that a thing that can be known by reason is equally known to the prophets and the laymen. Hence, although they heard from, the, from God, these two should not be counted among the commandments, but the other commandments belong to the class of things known by tradition which is or is generally accepted. Hence, it was necessary that they should be heard from God. And the rabbis don't, do not speak of them as having been heard from the mouth of strength. So far, Maimonides. Now, since they, they agree that Israel heard all ten commandments from God, his words require examination. It's true that the first commandment teaches the existence and unity of God, while why it was necessary to reveal these two commandments through the prophetic inspiration. Human reason is sufficient to prove them, and anyone denying them can be compelled by rational arguments to acknowledge the truth. There was more needed to be revealed through the prophetic inspiration, those things which human mind alone cannot discover. And there are, hence... <coughs> There are greater uh, objections to Maimonides' opinion that he says in the book of Mada. Of Mada, the, the heathens argued as follows. God created the stars and the spheres to control the world. He placed them in heaven and showed them honor. They are his, they are his servants and they serve him continually. Hence they deserve praise and glorification and honor. It is God's desire that we should show honor and respect to anyone whom he honors and to whom he gives greatness as kings desires the honor be shown to his, his servants who stand before him. And for this reason, the heathens offered sacrifices to the heavenly bodies and praised and glorified them and bowed down to them in order to obtain the favor of God. Such was the erroneous opinion in the second of chapter of the same treatise, he says, it is not proper to serve them, the stars, as mediators between man and his creator. Now, my question, I have the following. <coughs> Talking about serving these as mediators, which we have, and Alba, as you will see, will have an issue with this whole concept of Mashiach being a mediator, which was basically the, ve the very throng of the Christian argument. That, that Mashiach or the Christ or however you want to call the, the coming of the Mashiach that he served as a mediator between God and Israel he was to be even to the point of to be worshipped according to Christendom and according to other groups in Judaism according to Maimonides opinion therefore since reason might seem to favor the worship of stars and spheres and constellation on the two grounds just mentioned the first commandment should have warned against it Instead, concerning themselves or itself with God's existence and unity, which not even the heathens denied, according to this opinion. 
My opinion says Rabbi Abba. So let's take a look at this. Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Shehakon Nehiya Bivaro. My opinion is that the heathens were led their wrong worship by different reasons. In other words, the heathen basically <coughs> worship erroneously. Yes, the non-Jewish people were worshiping and are worshiping erroneously. The error of some was due to the fact that they denied the existence of the unity of God, believing that God is corporal power and He is the soul of the sphere, which is the belief of the Epicureans. This and these require no prophetic refutation for the reason can convince them with conclusive proof. Others were led into error worshipping uh, the, the spheral powers. You might say the the, <clears throat> the different dimensions, the different powers. For these two reasons we mentioned above the, the name of Maimonides. The example of this are Ahab and the kings of Israel and Judah. Solomon too seems to have fallen into this error as appears from the literal meaning of the scriptural text. All of these men believed in the existence and unity of God in prophecy and the revelation of Torah and yet they fell into this error either because they thought in this way to honor God or because they thought of making mediators between themselves and to God as Maimonides says. There's still another sect of men who erroneously incline to idolatrous worship for a deep, deep, deep reason and they hold with some of the philosophers that God has forsaken the land. Believe in the existence and unity of incorporeality of God, they hold that God has to care for the lower worlds at all, thinking it's a sign of greatness in God. That he pays no attention to human species because man is inferior and despised by him, him being God. They think it is a virtue and a sign of nobility in God to refute attention to that which is inferior, saying that in respect to the inferior thing, ignorance is better than knowledge. Job, or Job, inclined to this opinion when he said, What is man that thou should magnify him, and thou should set thy heart upon him? Therefore he thought that the lower world is controlled by the spheres, referring to such powers and persons as David said, Who exalts thee with a wicked thought? That is to say, they exalt and lift thee up. By his exaltation is a wicked, is wicked thought, and that they, they say that thou dost not pay attention to particulars, because the thing that thou, thou think that it would be a defect in the nature of God and, he, if, and if he took account of the particular sense this would necessitate his being favorably disposed at one time and angry at another time and, to, and, and so with other qualities which indicates change in us and therefore would have argued in the defect in his nature as he changed from favor to anger the opinion, therefore, is that the lower world is governed by spheres and that God has no knowledge of it at all. He's completely, as it were, removed. They also say that God created stars and constellations and angels to rule over the lower world. The reason why you see a lot of these Kabbalists, these mystical esoterists of today, always looking and asking questions as to what is your sign? What is your constellation? What day were you born? At uh, what hour? What minute? Or let me read your palm. Let me see the lines of your hands. My friends, if you have any rabbis like this, stay away and run for your lives from such persons. These are what um, many other rabbis called Sheker Kabbalists. Stay away from them. If you see them toting these type of symbols and so forth, they're no different than the uh, diviners and enchantment uh, predictors of the past. But now they're modernly made here today so they can be able to deceive and dissuade people in the belief of one God. They also say that since God created these stars, the angels rule, and the angels to rule over the lower world and assign them to dominions over the nations as we read, which the Lord thy God hath allotted unto all thy people under the whole heaven, and influence comes through them, we must prepare ourselves to receive the influence from them, and must worship them since they control us and exert influence upon us. <coughs> this was the opinion, by the way, 
of the accursed woman who said to Jeremiah but since we left we are left off to offer to the Queen of Heaven <laughs> <Excuse me. coughs> the Queen of Heaven happens to be the same Madonna figure that you see in a lot of the different religious symbols the Queen of Heaven is usually a, a virgin who has a child who has stars over her head this is the Queen of Heaven ancient paganism of the old time it was poured out drink offerings unto her and we have wanted all things this is what this woman this accursed woman mentioned that uh, that Albo mentions about Jeremiah they say also every one of the seven metals is peculiarly pe peculiarly related to one of the seven planets coal for example corresponds to the Sun silver to the moon lead to Jupiter and so on and when we figure and when a figure is made of a certain metal at a certain hour corresponding to the star in, is in the center position in relation to the stars the spiritual influence of that star in question hence comes the worship of the figures of the heathens made by the heathens you know those of you basically who are still involved in Catholicism you know very well how the Virgin Mary and the statue is worshipped and idolatrized just like uh, in other figures in other parts of India and uh, other parts of the world where they worship the the Madonna figure it's the same thing it's idolatry and they also say that a drop of human seed I want you to listen to this this is what Rabbi Abba is saying having the knowledge of that he had regarding Christianity and they say also that a drop of human seed enters into the humidurus at a moment of a certain position of the diviner or prognosticator by virtue of a spiritual influence of the star and may even obtain a high degree that he may be worshipped himself like the figures which the ancients made this was the error, error of Pharaoh and of Hiram the king of Tyre who made themselves God and of Nebuchadnezzar who made Daniel an object of worship <laughs> yes Daniel they made them to worship him as we read and they worship Daniel and commanded that they should offer an offering and sweet odors unto him all of this was error and due to the fact that they did not believe that God takes care of the human race now I want to ask you they did this to Daniel did they not do this to all of the holy men of the children of Israel, including David, including all of the kings, including all of the leaders? We have many instances, both in Jewish literature as well as non-Jewish literature, how the nations of the world would bow down and begin to worship Jews. There was no difference during the first century regarding this. And this is where Albo is leading the conversation to how they took a Jewish Orthodox man and they transformed him into a divine human being, a God-made man, just like with Caesar. And this brings the point to the forefront of this argument of Rabbi Albo. And such a, as this opinion sounds very plausible, so as far as reason goes and was very prevalent that the time when the Torah was given God was concerned about it and wanted to eradicate it completely God is not pleased with this type of service and it could not be eradicated through a prophet for one who denied providence and revelation would deny the divine origin of prophecy in which the religionists believed God therefore wanted to show as firmly as possible the refutation of this idea as well as the idea of the absence of the providence and the sign of greatness and the idea of making the heavenly bodies mediators between man and God this end he accomplished by showing to them that there is there is a, such a thing as prophecy and revelation of a law to guide men in the right path but this cannot be unless God does provide for man this was made clear to them when they received from him through prophetic inspiration face to face the first two commandments the first commandment teaches that God provides for us and guides us this is the meaning of the expression thy God the one who guides thee 
The commandment ends with the words, Who brought thee out of the land of Egypt? I am the one who took care of thee and took thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So now being out of the house of bondage, are we returning back to that by accepting a man God as our Savior and our Deliverer? Now this points to the providence, for the consolation indicated that you were to be a slave, but I took you out of, of there, and with great strength, hence the expression, out of the house of bondage. You see, my friends, when we serve something that is made by God, a creation of God, a human being born of, of, of blood and flesh, we enter into the stage of being brought back into bondage. And this is why no true Jew, no true Jew, no Jew who basically is free will become subservient to the idea of God made in human form or comes into the, the, the idea of serving a man who is God in the flesh. This brings humankind and the people of Israel back to bondage. Now do you understand why Christianity in particular and other isms are so refuted by those Jews who know their Torah, who knows what God says and what God wants? What you saw with your own eyes at the time of Exodus, says Rabbi Abo, proves the existence of providence. Now what you hear me now speaking to you proves that there is such a thing as prophecy. This commandment refuted the philosophical opinion which we mention, but we will still remain remained the possibility of retaining to the other ideas, namely that the angels of the stars of the constellations are mediators between God and man, or that it is proper for man to worship them on the grounds that they are that that they exalt God and perform his will, seeing that God has shown them honor and therefore he added the second commandment. What is the second commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. This is a prohibition of worshiping the separate intelligence, the angels. For as the rabbi say in Melchita, so does Rabbi Nachmanides say in his commentary on the section of Yethro, that the angels are everywhere called other gods before me. Even if you do believe in my providence, you must have no other gods to bring in as a mediator between you and me. Nor must you think that, that you will exalt me by worshiping them or giving them the honor that only belongs to me. Not to speak of expecting to receive any influence from them without my knowledge. Then he says, then God says, Thou shalt not make unto thee a graven image, nor any manner of likeness, nor anything similar to these angels. There's a big problem in, in Halakha regarding having these angelic figurines and forms and so Oh, very beautiful! But these graven images are completely prohibited also as a warning against the figures which are made to receive through the astral influence figures which are everywhere in scripture called molten gods. You see, they are made by human form. They are worshipped given attributions which they do not have. They have a mouth, they don't speak. They have, they have ears, but they don't hear. They have eyes, but they don't see. This according even to the psalmist. The commandment ends up, For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. That is to say, do not think to exalt me by worshipping them. God does not need to have you recognize them to recognize him. Only recognize him. For it will have the opposite effect if you recognize them. Why? Because it says, I shall be jealous of them. Now thus, all possible opinions are refuted which might lead to the worship of idols or any other gods but the Lord. But God was not concerned to refute the opinion of the Epicurus, who denied the existence and unity of God and thought that God is the soul of the celestial sphere. For he can be convinced 
by the conclusive rational argument, whereas the other opinion needed refutation, as we have explained. Thus, our explanation that our explanation of the purpose of the first commandments, namely to refute the opinions of the philosopher, is correct, is proved by the fact that the immediately after the Sinaitic revelation, Moses was told, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye yourselves have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, gods of gold. Now this is a very powerful statement because many have made from the silver and from the gold into deities or divi divinities. And yet here we have this combination of God of gold, God of silver. And it seems very strange that immediately after the Ten Commandments that we have again the prohibition of idolatry, which had been already for forbidden in the Second Commandment. But the meaning is that God being exalted in the dwelling in heaven, so too dignified to have anything to do with his corporal, um, his corporal thing, and that he does not provide for the human race because man is inferior and despised uh, and despised and unworthy of, of such dignity. And the idea that there is a seed of figure or a need of figure <coughs> or mediators between him and through and through uh, the creation. Such idea between him and, and us through through whom God's spiritual power may descend, these were the causes of Israel's major mistake in making the calf. Therefore he says, Ye yourselves have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. That is to say, you have seen that I have I am exalted in heaven. I lowered my dignity and did not refrain from speaking to you, though all of you, except Moses, were unprepared for such dignity. This shall be the indication to you that I provided man, though he is inferior and despised and unworthy of my providence. Therefore you shall not make with me gods of silver and gods of gold so so as to cause my spirit to descend for my influence can be obtained with something less valuable and the altar of the earth thou shalt make unto me and i dwell in the high and holy place with him who who with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit imagine this that god can be able to inhabit the life of a person who is contrite and humble, or even with something that is less substantial than this, namely with prayer. In every place where I came, my name to be mentioned, I, I will come unto thee and bless thee. I will cause my blessing to emanate upon you. In this way where you refuted these options which led to error and idolatry to, prevalent, to, to so prevalent in those days and in our time to, today. My friend, God does not want you to worship something less than what he has for you. And God in us reveals his, his incredible power when we recognize him in every aspect of our lives. It might seem, however, that the first two commandments would be sufficient. But one might say that the first two commandments do not necessarily show that there is a special providence in human affairs. For they deal only with God himself and prohibits substitutions of other worship for the worship of God. This proves only generally the providence of species as a whole, but not special or individual providence, since the first two commandments says nothing about the conduct of men in relationship to one another, which would indicate special providences. For this reason it was necessary to give them, on the same occasion, the other commandments necessary to teach revelation and providence, as we're going to explain later with God's help, Bezrat Hashem. The difference between the first two commandments and the rest is that the first two Israel heard from God without mediation of Moses, and therefore they are expressed in the first person. I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God of them that love me and keep my commandments. But beginning with the third commandment, all in the third person, because Moses was speaking to them in the name of God, thou shalt not 
take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Instead, I will not hold guiltless. Take my name. Similarly, we read, For in the six days the Lord made, and he rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, instead of saying, I made and I blessed, I sanctified, and so on. This shows the difference between the first two commandments and the rest that follows. The first two they heard directly from God, without mediation of Moses. So this is why the idea of the unity of God and the oneness of God does not only apply to the children of Israel, but everyone that was there, the whole entire nations of the world heard what was going on. Heard far, but they heard this transmission to the children of Israel. This is what is meant, the rabbis mean that they say that they heard the first two commandments from the mouth of the Almighty a very powerful God. The meaning is that since God spoke these two commandments to Israel himself face to face without the mediation of Moses, no prophet has the power to say anything against them or to weaken them in any way, even a temporary measure. This is why they use the expression from the mouth of the Almighty and not from the mouth of God to indicate that anything which is told through the prophet to another prophet has the, po has the power to abolish either as a temporary measure or as a circumstance to determine for the instance of Jeremiah abolish the counting of the month of Nisan or from Nisan but that which is told to a person by God without the mediation of a prophet no prophet has the power to abolish even something temporarily hence the statements of the rabbis if a prophet tells the people to worship idols even temporarily he must not obey why the first two commandments encumbers and covers that prohibition if a uh, anyone says worship this man who's God in the flesh bow down to him we are to not listen to that preacher that prophet that naysayer completely reject him well you know uh, J.C. is God. you got to bow down to him. He is Lord of No, you don't. No, the Rebbe is the very Ainsoff in human flesh. No, we don't listen to that. It goes against the word of the first two commandments that thou shalt not have any gods before me. And yes, my friends, a human being can be considered a god. If a prophet tells the people to worship an idol, even temporarily, he must not be obeyed. But if he says that we should violate the Sabbath or transgress some other commandments as a temporary measure, say, even to save a life, even permanently transgress some one of the commandments uh, provided he does not subvert the very foundations of the faith, we must listen to him because it says, Unto him ye shall hearken. And he says, God commanded me that you shall pray to a certain star or a certain angel that should be a mediator between him and you. We must not pay any attention to him. And because it's an opposition to the first commandment, we heard from God directly. And no prophet may listen to another prophet trying to abolish something which he himself heard from God. As we have explained. And thus... Rabbi Abba establishes as a basic foundation, very basic, the idea that if anyone says worship another thing aside or next to or shituf, then God, we are to what? Not listen to him. It's a false prophet. It's a false preacher. It goes against to what God himself told the children of Israel face to face and we heard it all from the time of Moses. Now, my challenge to every single person who has embraced what they call messianic or belief in, in, in Jesus as God, as the intermediator between God and man, to answer this. Because obviously this faces a major challenge to many of those Jews, I'm referring to Jews in particular, 
that have decided to be go messianic, that decides to go against them. If you give any honor or pray to Jesus as a mediator, and you're Jewish, you're going against what God told the children of Israel in these first commandments. And this is exactly what Rabbi Albo is saying in his treatise of Sefer HaIkarim, based on Torah, based on rabbinical tra uh, tradition, and based on rational logic from within the Torah itself. This is why it becomes so problematic, problematic for a Jew for Jesus to say that they believe in Jesus as a mediator, as an intercessor between themselves and God. It completely goes against the very basic foundations of the first two commandments of God's commandments. Now, this is not required by the nations of the world. As we saw earlier in Rabbi Alba's whole entire uh, lecture, that in fact it's permitted, but it's permitted based as an error, as doing it wrong. Now here we come with what's going to happen in the last days. In the last days we are told clearly that the nations of the world will wake up to the reality that there is no other God but God. That there is no intermediator between God and the whole creation. Only God are we to invoke and seek his presence and face and his will. Not a human being, not, not a Messiah, not a Christ, not a Mashiach, not a, uh, a Medi-figure, only God. And the only reason we listen to a prophet is because these two commandments, if they're not violated and he upholds, then we can listen to the words of the prophet. The future prophets are to come. To come. But if they come in with this makeshift new idol or new service or new worship, like what happened in the first century with Jesus, what happened also during the time of Shabbatai V, what happened also a more recent time where they made um, you know, the, 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 the Mashiach figure into the, the whole of all, that if you don't believe in him as Mashiach and to be the, the end of all, you are not uh, truly in the true belief, that's falseness, my friends. And this is why it becomes very fundamental, becomes very basic, that anyone that leads you on to the wrong way as a Jew into the belief that A is somehow divinely uh, empowered in a human clothing as God in the flesh is misleading you. Not only misleading you, it says it goes right against these two basic commandments that God told the whole people of Israel, my fellow Jews that are listening. Now you understand why in every generation this whole concept of Mashiach when it's mixed in with this idolatrous concept which is called Minut from the very first century that our rabbi said is this is Minut Notzrim this is the, the heresy of the Notzrim they said it from the very early beginning that has basically harmed this whole idea of serving only one God when people begin to reject that this is why I say from the very beginning I want you to understand the logic here. When a Christian moves away from believing in Jesus as God, they have moved in such a way against the very foundation of what idolatry is and have embraced the idea, I will serve only God as indicated by the laws of Moses. And if you want to say, okay, the commandment that Jesus taught us is to follow the teachings of the rabbis as indicated in Matthew and other passages, then what you're doing for yourselves and for those around you, you're basically disconnecting yourself and becoming disconnecting for yourself from the idolatry that it has been retained within that system of belief. You're not denying God. You're affirming the belief in the one God. And this becomes stronger than ever. So the question is begged, and this question has been begged by many of you who happen to be messianics. Can I still follow so and so as you know as 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 a leader but not follow the, the idolatrous ways of the Christian world 
And I usually answer for a non Jew, yes. It's permitted for you. But it's still, there's a lot of things in it that you're not able to distinguish between A and B. You can fall back into that resource. Now, obviously, if you decide to basically leave it all together and embrace Judaism by through the form of conversion, it's much, much better, and it is much, much encouraged. Even the Rambam encouraged that. And if you don't want to do that, at least make the commitment to follow seven universal laws. Which, like I mentioned earlier, for those non-Jews that are accustomed to be congregating, you'd be better off remaining and denying and negating that of this basic principles of that a human being is God in the flesh and follow the concept that only God can be prayed to. But the problem... This is the this is the earnest problem. You cannot so easily remove yourself from worshiping only God and then going into a congregation in which they are constantly invoking the worship of a human being as God in flesh, born of a virgin, like we just talked about, which just Rabbi Abo and uh, spoke about. And this becomes the challenge to many of you in the Christian world. You'd be better off converting over to Judaism, becoming a Jew, and saying, I am Yehudi. I cannot fathom the idea of being attached to idolatry in the way that I was before. See, when you break away from that mindset, and it is a, a spiritual mindset, it is a spiritual bondage. I've got to emphasize this. It is a spiritual bondage being completely under the bond that you think that a human being is your go in between is your mediator between God and man by the way these ideas are also completely inundated and within Judaism the idea that I'm going to go follow so and so uh, he's my go between as it were between me and God because I'm not worthy to go to God directly and you'll find that very prevalent in a lot of the the, the Hasidic mentality of today. That, yeah, yeah, you can, you can, you know, he is your teacher. You, 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 you can, you can get directly, connect directly to God through this teacher. That, my friends, that concept is what I had mentioned for many, many years. Is the same ideology of the Menut Notrim of the first century, which our rabbis prohibited us and involving and dictating and it's also very prevalent to let you know and I know I'm going to get in trouble for what I'm going to say right now God help me is very prevalent in a lot of the Kabbalistic works and purposely done so by the Kabbalist that originally created the text so anyone involved in the Kabbalah Hasidut world you will be inundated with this idea can I follow this teacher and be connected to God? Can he be my mediator? This is exactly the core of what Rabbi Albo hits very strikingly against. He goes at the very core of this. It's a different thing that you're following a teacher, a chacham, a, a leader of the people. And you're doing so within the, the, the framework of Torah Judaism. But it's a different thing to be worshipping a man as the all in all of your life. Human worship still is present even within Judaism. It goes to the point of reverence. It goes beyond reverence to honor and worship. And that, my friend, is a big no-no. And this is what Rabbi Abba is addressing in the Sefer HaIkarim, in the fundamentals of Judaism. Even if you were to pray and this I feel for my, my Christian friends because they teach them they indoctrinate them that you're supposed to pray in the name of JC and they end up praying to JC there's a big distinction there because they're supposed to be doing things praying to God in the merit of JC but they end up praying to JC they end up worshipping JC they end up bowing down to JC or in, in the image or man, imagination of J.C. And that, 
is idolatry. Same thing happens in, in, in the, the Hasidic world. I'll never forget the story that was told to me of a man in Argentina who serves as a slaughterer. He does shachita. This man happened to be and I'm not going to make him move him because I got enough trouble with what I have already spoken. But he would, before doing shachita, he would basically say, I am doing this shachita, I'm doing the slaughtering of these animals on behalf and in merit of my my teacher, so and so. Which I believe he is God in flesh. He is he is the ain self in the human form. This is what they believe. And he would say, Yehi Adunenu Rabbeinu Moreinu Melech HaMashiach Le'olam Ba'ed. And he would begin to slaughter the, the meat. So the question arises whether that meat is kosher or not. Since he basically provided to honor his teacher, his master, his Lord, his divine the guide who no longer is in this physical world though he's they say he is with this adoration this service of sacrificing and slaughtering these animals is that meat kosher and obviously one of the things that makes the meat kosher is the intention of the slaughterer if the intention of the slaughter is to work is to serve other idols or other gods all of that meat, even though by every single detail of the process of killing the animal is done perniciously to the detail of halacha, it is rendered completely not kosher. Not kosher. Because they've offered to a God that is not God meat to be sacrificed to that God. Call him, you want to call it JC, you want to call him Mamash, call him whatever you want, that meat becomes completely usher, and we're better off to even buy meat that's not with that seal of approval. And I'm not the only one that says this. Many rabbis, many rabbis to this day, David Berger is one of the, one of the most voiceless ones who have been completely challenged. It's one of the ones that says, don't buy that. Many other rabbis, Orthodox, non, non uh, Hasidic rabbis have said the same thing. And other Hasidic groups have said the same thing. Because the problem becomes as whether or not they are worshipping a God that is not God. And this gives you a, a screen test. A test that say, can I determine if this is going to be kosher, fit for my consummation or not? The question you have to ask yourself, is the slaughterer a mishachist is the slaughterer one of those guys that basically believes that the, the leader of that movement is, is, is physically God in the flesh or was physically God in the flesh this was happening in first century Christianity we had the same issue also 2000 years ago and has been repeated throughout the history once the Jewish people embraces the idea that God we go to God directly no mediators then you free yourself from the bondage of what it is having a mediator and going direct to God, which means that you have to prepare yourself to meet your God on a daily basis. That's completely different than what they're teaching today. And my friends, this is the reason why they ask me, Rabbi, do you you do you promote the idea of, of having people learn Kabbalah, of learning the, the esoteric? You know what I tell them very simply? No. Stay away from it because in the actual text till this day there is a lot of contaminations of the minute that the very Kabbalists put into the text and has been very very well knitted within the actual text message <coughs> that would make it very easy for a new Christianity to arise and it has so this becomes a major thing that we need to be aware of we need to be aware that where your food source spiritually is coming from is pure in the sense of does not go in confrontation to these two commandments that has to do with idolatry and the service of, of other mediators between you and God. 
you know there are a lot of things music and so forth I really love and what makes a lot of the music non-kosher has to be it has to do with this same point very moment that they give honor and glory to a particular human being it's idolatrous music people don't understand that it becomes idolatrous and believe me a lot of people love gospel music as a genre they love other music that is serves to to worship God but the very moment the words and the rhythms and the association is connected to idolatry it becomes prohibited there's a way to reform it there's a way to you might say uh, purify it but I'm not going to get into that with you guys in this video but there is a way to transform it and make make it kosher and Abba goes into chapter 19 from this clear divine law that cannot change in respect to the three general principles he had mentioned and it's within these two commandments from God that makes it clear that we even if a prophet from God who produces miracles from God if they violate these two basics and teach others to do the same we are in our right to reject that prophet and not even pay attention to ignore him and ignore any threats that may come from him or his movements of, of eternal condemnation and this is the basis this is the chutzpah this is the validity that we as Jews have and be able to say with all of our hearts yes we're not afraid of any condemnation that this guy JC throws at us because of his movement and because of people basically worshiping him as a God we're not afraid because God himself says you are being tested and you have the right to reject that person that movement that entire group of people who basically is pushing their idea of salvation through a human being as the divine mediator between God and man even if another person in the book of Acts says there's no other mediator that was given except this man we must and do reject the words of those individuals as going against the words of Moses so the problem becomes equated which words are more factual and which we must listen to the words of Paul the words of those disciples who follow this man and made into this man a complete idolatrous movement or do we listen to Moses and do we listen to God obviously the choice is clear we listen to God we listen to what Moses basically gave us because the children of Israel heard God directly we didn't have no mediators we will not have any mediators even all potential messiahs to come have to surpass has to jump these two obstacles they don't meet these two obstacles and they begin to lead other people to worship them to follow them and to become they the very center piece of their whole entire movement we reject it as they are trying to become an intermediary between Israel and God and there is according to this, these two commandments no intermediary between God and the children of Israel God and the children of Israel goes direct there is no mediation this is very well but, but wait, wait 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 you say there's no mediation how about Moses Moses himself is laying down the order <coughs> they believed in Moses as God's prophet but not as God yes he was called a God but they never worshiped Moses that was the work of the adversary who attempted to take the body of Moses and animate it to be able to get people to worship him and God said no no that was a big no no and that's why till this day the Jewish people don't worship Moses they highly esteem him they highly follow his rules and laws and the two laws that Moses did not admit are these two laws that Rabbi Abel makes mention in the book of Exodus and throughout the Torah this is Rabbi Moshe Otero and I hope you enjoyed this morning's Shirim and please share this message 
to others who are learning because it's of great importance that we stay away from idolatry and this is one of the ways we stay away from idolatry and that is embracing Torah and Torah's commandment. Shalom, shalom.